Hey YouTube, it's Pastor Dwayne here. Today we are going to be talking to Timothy Decker, and uh, he wrote a uh, rather interesting article lately about the Textus Receptus, and uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, so Timothy, why don't you go ahead and say hello to everybody? Hello, everybody. Let me ask you this. So the article that you wrote, uh, you you did a, a project. I, I'm going to ask you how long it took. I, I think I did on a Facebook question or something. Um, but you you basically compared every Texas Receptus that you could get your hands on. Uh, and you pulled out some results uh, to validate a claim. And, and the specific claim that we're talking about is those who would hold to a TR position would say... Uh, or, or like the TBS article says, the TBS article states something along the lines of, you know, there's no major variance between the various Textus Receptus editions. And so you took that and you ran with it and you decided to go see if that's true. And so you compared, I don't know, how many, how many editions of the Textus Receptus did you compare? Uh, well, I started with Erasmus's five editions. Uh, I tried to go, here's my methodology. Uh, I tried to go yeah. in, in chronology. So after Erasmus, I would use the Complutensian polyglot, which Scrivener himself mentions in the development of the Texas Receptus. Aldine, Colinaeus, those are often mentioned in, in the development. Uh, two others I added in there. This was by the prompting of Elijah Hickson. Mm -hmm. um, they were uh, they worked with Erasmus. They knew Erasmus. They were part of the uh, Continental Reformation. Gerbelius, or Gerbelius, however you want to pronounce it, and Copeful. Uh, they were both early reformed tradition, uh, I'm sorry, early TR traditions, and they, they were familiar with Luther, Melanchthon, and, and so forth. And so I thought that would be good uh, to add in there. And then you would do your standards, your uh, four Stephanos editions. Beza is a tricky one because there's a lot of editions with Beza. And so hmm. I just decided, let me do the uh, folio editions, what are called the major editions, the, mm -hmm. the octavo editions, or the minor editions. Uh, I did not do just because, like you said, it's a very laborious project. And yes. then I did one other Beza edition that was published posthumously. Uh, and there was two different publishers in 1611, one Crispin, and I forget the other fellow's name. And I did the Crispin edition just because his name is attached to it. So I did that one as well. Uh, then, um, who am I forgetting? Uh, Beza, uh, then the Elzevirs, uh, and the only two Elzevirs that I think are are, are uh, needing to really be developed would be the first two editions. They have others, but I think they're pretty mm -hmm. much identical after that. And then uh, the Oxford Texas Receptus is the last one I did in 1870 or 1873, just to see. And there are, I did, I, I've come across a few unique Scrivener's, Scrivenerisms uh, after doing okay. all this too. So uh, that was kind of the, the idea for these are the popular Texas Receptus editions that would often be mentioned. And all of all of those, I gained access, either me just searching Google or Elijah mm -hmm. Hickson put me into contact with the digital version of them. I'm Ooh, so okay. amazed how he was able to, he has, he has compiled a, a, a library of Texas Receptus editions. And, and I just did 21, 22. He's got over, well, I don't know how many, I want to say 50, 60, 70. He's got a lot of them. We could have expanded. But, right, uh, right. I have a life. I have a wife, kids, you know, job. <laughs> so I can't, I can't spend That's all my right. time doing that. So what, what kind of prompted you to do the work? Because the coll collation between like two editions is enough to do, let alone, you know, what, like 30? How, how many editions did you end up with in the end? I think and it was how, 22. How, yeah. That, 22, that, that's a lot. 22 different Texas Receptus tradition <laughs> editions or so forth. Um, what prompted? Well, I, I really feel like it was the only way to substantiate or uh, disavow the claims that are often made by proponents of the advocates of the Texas Receptus. And it, it was not that I set out for a mission. I, I'm finding myself as I'm collating these things. And, and this is what's called um, a diplomatic. What, what I was doing is a diplomatic uh, edition. Uh, I'm not. I'm not doing a critical text. I'm doing a diplomatic text. So Scrivener's um, 1881 was my comparative uh, text, and I compared everything from that. And so I'm not trying to assess which is the best TR reading. I'm just comparing everything to Scrivener. And right. I, the only way I could think of to say is, are these claims true or not is to just go through them. And uh, I found myself actually. Uh, surprised, so surprised at how often I would come to a uh, a, a variant. You call it a variant. Uh, yeah. That I, I was just expecting their claim. I, I did not expect the outcome 
that I that I got. I, I was expecting there to be a lot more stability, uh, a lot more uh, unity, and there is. There's a lot of unity. Don't don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, the tradition itself is a very stable tradition, but I think it right. it, it does force itself into the idea that the Texas Receptus is, is its own stream of textual family uh, or text type. Even you, could, it's not Byzantine. It's its own text type. If you want right. to do it that way, but yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I felt like that was the only way I could, in my mind, either disprove or prove the claim of, uh, of you know, the Trinitarian Bible Society claims about, you know, hardly any uh, differences, very minor insignificant differences. Well, let me put it to the test and see. Um, mm -hmm. I knew that there was one passage. So I did the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew 6, 7 and 8. And that com comes out to be 111 verses. And so I knew that there was one important variant by Beza at Matthew 6, 1. And I wasn't sure which variation, which edition it was going to show up. I just knew uh, mm. in Beza's 1598 edition, the one that the King James would use. Yeah. I knew that he, he took an alternate reading there. So I said, all right, this seems to be a good place, the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, I was just going to do Matthew 6. And then when I'm talking with a couple other guys to see if this is a project worth doing, research worth doing, they said, just go ahead and do the whole Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, that, that stinks because now that's a whole lot more I have yeah. to do. <laughs> that's uh, right. I'm glad I did. It was, it was worth, worth the time. Yeah, nobody – I don't think anyone has ever done anything like that. So you're, you're kind of like trailblazing, right? <laughs> the, the, Possibly. The TR it's given me the idea of, of continuing on and the project would be daunting, but to do the entire New Testament hmm. – hmm. Uh, I think that would be a, a neat exercise, and I could see it profiting uh, multiple groups. Whether you're for the TR against the TR, I could see everyone benefiting from having a yeah, like I, I think even apparatus our, of all these additions. Yeah, even our uh, brothers in the in the confessional bibliology camp would probably find something like that interesting. I, I'm sure that they would see that as a a threat. At least some of them might, but but initially it would be good to see. Uh, where the TR has has the variance. When it comes to dividing the variance that you're seeing up into categories, you, you came up with three categories. There was category one, category two, category three, and you kind of had a different level of effect it would have on the meaning uh, of the, of a specific passage. So can you kind of give us a, a sort of rundown of what each category was and how you broke down how um, how different the variants were? Yeah. So there, I, the categories were based on the words of the, the two articles I cited from the Trinitarian Bible Society. Hmm. And they, they spoke in terms of there's no significant differences. There's only minor significance of spelling, you know, variation and other untranslatable differences and things like that. I'd, I'd have to read it. Sure. So I thought, well, there's two categories of one that it might affect the sense, but only if you're, you know, looking at the the grammatical categories in Greek, um, what might distinguish, you know, an, an, an aorist versus um, a present tense. Right. Um, with a non-indicative that that's somewhat major. I'm teaching my Greek students that's important, but, you know, how it comes out in translation might not even be noticed. Right. Then you have those where... Uh, you you have spelling differences or things like that, uh, or just leaving off the final new or the final sigma. Those things those are only important for people who are doing that kind of research on that kind of you know pedantic level. Uh, yeah, and, and it's important because sometimes you see progression, sometimes you see regression, and so I, I included that, but I didn't include uh, those in my count. And so there's two categories right there, but I thought there needs to be another category just in case they were wrong, and there was. What if there are right. significant, translatable, like you could read them in your King James or your New King James or whatever Bible, and you could see that there is a difference. Well, they didn't account for that. So that's where a Category 1 variance came out. And it could be, some might call call um, changing a an upsilon to an, an eta, making it U to we is all it yeah. would take to do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, an insignificant variant, or at least a Category 2. I bumped it to Category 1 because... Uh, when it comes up to the Lord's Prayer, you know, we're so accustomed to hearing our Father who is in heaven. But there sure. were a few Texas Receptus editions that said your Father mm -hmm. who are in heaven, which, I mean, that would just disrupt everything. And so that's a translatable, noticeable difference on a very well-known quotable passage. So I thought these need to be in category one. because I think in the Sermon on the Mount, there was 10 or 11 of those uh, pronoun uh, issues. So if it's translatable. 
and uh, significant enough that it should be, I, I included it in category one. So the categories themselves came from the the articles or the, the preface from the, the TR. I'm using their language and affirming to the categories, you know, minor variants mm -hmm. or spelling mm -hmm. insignificances. But then the other category I added were if they were right or not, if they're wrong, then there's a third category or category one is what I called it. Most significant variant uh, or most surprising one was the one I had mentioned earlier from Matthew 6, 1, where Beza, uh, his 1598, uses the uh, righteousness that if you uh, do your righteousness, uh, your righteous deeds before mm -hmm. men versus your charitable deeds, which that, I mean, yeah, that that's insignificant in terms of interpretation. Maybe the words are completely different. And the reason mm -hmm. it does matter is because uh, the Sermon on the Mount is built off, built off of threes. Um, if you if you do some intricate studies on the the tapestry, the organization, uh, it's built off of three. So Lord's Prayer, you got three. You know, uh, your will be done, or you know, your name be magnified, your will be done, uh, or your uh, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's it's done in threes. The mm -hmm. whole thing is done in threes. And so if you take the charitable deeds uh, reading, which the TR by and large does then it absorbs verse one of Matthew six into uh, the, the preceding context. Whereas if you take one as the righteous deeds, it kind of becomes a uh, interpretively, it becomes this, this introduction to the group of three that you'll have with charitable deeds, fasting and praying. And so it, I mean, that, that turns out to be a significant variant, not just because the words are completely different, but also because it leads to a different interpretation and it, it could have effect on how you understand uh, Matthew 6 in the preceding context and uh, the, the the structure of the Sermon on the Mount. And not okay. only that, uh, a lot of people have cited Matthew 6, 1 in the Reformed tradition. I, I came across this uh, just as an interesting variant by looking at how Reformed, Orthodox, and, and, and Puritans had dealt with this variant and they kind of like it could be this one or it could be that one and you know you decide so they kind of leave right. it up to the reader and so um that's why i thought that might be a good place and uh that was still a stunning variant that what and perhaps what what makes it so stunning is that in all of Beza's edition except for the 1598 his last edition mm -hmm. he leaves it as the uh merciful uh or the the charitable deeds rather than the righteous act right um he leaves it there, but in every annotation, he argues for the righteousness reading. Well, finally, he okay. gets to the end, and he says, I'm just going to put in righteousness. So it makes me realize there is a lot more to be done. And I think Jan Kranz has, has brought this out. If you want to know what Erasmus or Beza were thinking in terms of text criticism, it's not necessarily their textus receptus that you need to look at. It's their annotations. And right. so a project like that needs to be done. Someone needs to go through Beza and um, translate his annotations so we can have a better understanding, or we all just need to learn Latin really fast. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I have so much on my plate now, I'm not proficient enough to, to do that. Right. But we, we already knew where he stood on that reading, but what prompted him <clears throat> to finally make the change in the text? And I think what makes that variant significant, if I can use the term variant, mm -hmm. is that it kind of shows their hesitation to deviate from the tradition. Jan Kranz kind of makes that point that once Erasmus kind of laid down that foundation, there was they were very slow to uh, change or move away. And um, especially by the time you get to Stephanus, he kind of sets the platform. And then yeah, yeah. there's a lot of hesitation to change from that. And I think that's just one sign. And take that for what it will, what you will. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. Maybe they got overly conservative. Uh, uh, erred on the side of caution. I don't know. Uh, or maybe it speaks to their understanding of providence and, and preservation, whichever. I'm just saying, I think that shows you that at some point, though, Beza said, I cannot in good conscience uh, leave the charitable mm -hmm. deeds reading in Matthew 6 1. And so he, uh, for whatever reason, he switches it in his final edition. And uh, so that, that seems to be pretty significant. That's interesting. Are there any other variants that you found to be kind of surprising? Yeah, the, the Complutensian polyglot is it's well known that it does not include the doxology to the Lord's Prayer. Okay. But what's interesting, I never knew this, is it gives a, a, a footnote in the margin about why. And the reason why, and again, I had to, you know, 
I, I'm not I'm not uh, a Latin scholar by any stretch, <laughs> so I had to do some research and work on this. But as best I understood, the reason that they claim that it should not be included is that it's likely, and that they use the the understanding of internal evidence that it's a reading that was inserted because its use was liturgical and because it became so part of the liturgical uh, recitation of the Lord's Prayer that scribes just assumed it should be part of the Lord's Prayer and therefore they started adding it. And so the Complutensian Polyglot does not use the the doxology to the Lord's Prayer. And while while most of us know that their reasoning for rejecting it is really interesting because that sounds like how we do modern textual criticism right they have a a harder reading or they have a shorter reading or they have a um uh, uh they just have internal evidence to reject it and that's what they leaned mm -hmm. upon so i thought that was pretty interesting as well that okay. in their in their margin they were they were talking about better readings and worse readings and so forth Right, right. Well, that's cool. So now, now if I'm a confessional bibliology, I'm just going to put on the CB hat for a moment, and I hear you talking about this and and uh, sharing all of the textual variants in here. Uh, I'm I'm not convinced, right? And the reason why I wouldn't be convinced as a confessional bibliologist, I'm not a confessional bibliologist. I'm just I'm just trying to come from it from that angle. I would say some of these variants, um, like the one you mentioned between righteous works and charity. Um, they made their way down the line through Stephanus and, and Beza and Elsevier, uh, and, it, and, it, and then ends up in our King James Bible. So these readings must have been relatively easy uh, for us through the textual text, text through the received text tradition for us to pick out. Um, so how how would you suggest? Like, like, what would you think of an argument such as that? I guess, you know, my, my point is not, is not necessarily to convince mm -hmm. a confessional bibliologist away from his Texas Receptus tradition, mm -hmm. but it's just be fair. I mean, the, the same measure that you measure against others, you need to measure against yourself. Right. And so um, with all of these variations, you need to at least be willing to say that your tradition is not as stable when you lean on preservation or or when you when someone on our side, whatever that side is, yeah. says, um, you know, no doctrine is affected by the variance and the confessional bibliologist replies, well, what about the doctrine of bibliology? Right. I want to then say that goes with you as well, because right. if you're arguing for, you know, a an absolute mm -hmm. an absolutism for the text, then you now have to give an account for these these jots and tittles. And these are more than just jots and tittles. Right. And so I want to hold you to the same standard and you need to be willing to own that, I think. And so it's not necessarily uh, to to dissuade a Texas Receptus proponent. It's just to be, you know, honest with the evidence. I, I, I think that's the major issue that those articles, you know, by uh, Trinitarian Bible Society, whether they were purposely dishonest or just misleading on accident, it that, that exposes that. The, the, those claims are not accurate and it's okay yeah that's fine you right. just need to make sure that you own that and are aware of that and so i would just hold, hold yourself to the same standard that you hold us and uh we'll be good right right now when you come back so again with my tr hat on <laughs> putting many hats on yeah so so when it comes to your category one you know major variants I think I even saw some pushback on that on on a couple Facebook comments suggesting, well, your category one variants are actually fairly weak, and and uh, although they represent a translatable difference, their meaning is actually essentially the same. Um, so how how would you defend uh, a category one reading? Like, could could you give us an example? Well, the Lord's Prayer being one of those, you know, a yeah. lot of people would say that changing the pronouns that happens. You know, mm. typically it's just one letter difference and they often sound the same. Okay, fine. But like I said, when it comes into quotable portions like the Lord's Prayer, to hear it as your father who is in heaven, that becomes pretty noticeable. Right. Um, but some that are harder to observe, but if you're if you're if you're and maybe it's because I'm I'm being a grammarian here. But simple omissions of uh, of the article or or change in the article, uh, for example, let me let me find a place where this this comes up could change how, how the grammar is understood. So let's see if I can find um, a verse. 
Yeah. So when it speaks of our father who is in secret and it's multiple times in, in chapter six, by the way, that's also done in threes anyways. Right. Um, okay. Uh, when you change where that article is located uh, or you remove that article in general, that, that article is in front of a prepositional phrase. Prepositional yep. phrases don't normally have an article. What, what that article does, right. it's not a definite article. There is no such thing mm -hmm. as a Greek definite article mm -hmm. because that would imply that there's an indefinite article and there's not. What the article does in front of a preposition is turns that preposition into some kind of substantive or adjective. In other words, right. it takes on, it, it forces that preposition <laughs> to take on properties, in this case, of an adjective. You leave mm -hmm. that article off, prepositions are normally adverbial. Prepositions are usually answering questions of who, where, why, when, how. So yep. in secret is saying where, unless it's turned with an article into an adjective and saying now it's describing our father who is in secret versus uh if the article is absent and some uh some tr editions uh omit the article now the reading would change the understanding would change to uh the father sees in secret mm -hmm. now again that's minor in terms of you know someone may or may not see that in a translation but that is a translatable difference but that is a huge interpretive difference because right. he, he is making a point about what you can see versus what you cannot see. And it's not right. the action who sees or how he sees it, but the, the one who sees. That's pretty big. Yeah. And so yeah. if you're gonna if you're gonna argue over, well, yeah, that's just an article being omitted, that's insignificant. I get that. And I didn't do that for every omission. Right. Some omissions are less significant than others. But those times where it does affect the grammar, the grammar affects the meaning, the meaning affects the translation, and, and, and translation affects the interpretation. Yeah, I added that to category one. So right. there might be some who dispute that, and that's fine. Um, sure. But uh, the, hmm. even, even if you don't like my category one uh, terminology, that's fine. But taking all of those 32 that I that I uh, that I have there, do those fit with how uh, I think it was Anderson and Anderson and then the, the Trinitarian Bible Society, those two articles, does that data fit what they said about the Texas Receptus? You know, put the right. nomenclature aside. Does it fit? It just, I don't hmm. think it does. I don't right. think it does. So get right. rid of the nomenclature. Just look at the evidence. Uh, I just did the categories just because it. I, I needed to be organized. And of course I did it in threes because it's the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, one one more TR hat question, then I'll take the TR hat off. All right, hard hard question incoming. All right, so we're we're talking about uh, textual variants between TR editions that are rather rather um, major in in their in the way they impact the meaning of of a passage. Um, so by suggesting that there are are these issues between TR editions, what does that say about the critical edition and some of the issues there? So are you willing to say that, yes, there are these category one issues that are rather significant uh, in the TR tradition, and then also say that there are these category one uh, variants within the critical text edition? Are you, are you prepared to go both ways with that? Sure. I, I, I think that's the interesting thing here, <clears throat> that those who would use the critical text, and by <laughs> the way, I'm not a <laughs> critical text proponent either. I have a very Good. nuanced methodology in my textual criticism, but... Good. Good. I'll ask you about that later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> um, but what, what I would say is that we, we've, we've not had a problem saying that for a while. We, we readily acknowledge gathering all the data. There are some significant and, and more significant than the TR variants. I, I'm fine with that. Hmm. that. That is okay. Um, but like I said, I just want you to, I want the, the confessional bibliologist or whatever term they're going to use. I want them to be held to that same standard that we're going to argue that because we have these cat like legitimate category one variants in our Bibles, um, we're not, we're not going to shy away from that reality. And we're going to still understand that they don't, they don't address, you know, they don't um, conflict with any major doctrines. And, um, and even the doctrine of bibliology, I don't think is affected by that because I would say that, uh, preservation goes not to the final edition, but to the manuscript tradition. And so mm -hmm. preservation and bibliology has been preserved. What is written is there in the in the Greek manuscripts and the Hebrew manuscripts and all that. Um, so I, I, I don't have a problem admitting category one variants. What I want is for the confessional bibliologist, the Texas Receptus advocate, the King James only ist to also admit honestly 
that your tradition has variants, major variants. And that's what I'm looking mm -hmm. for, at least in that uh, 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 honest admission of that. Thank you.